Punk Rock Horror Podcast, episode 23. I'm Matt. I'm Cody. And today we're going to be talking about the conflict between practical effects and CGI effects. Woot. Also, listeners, you're going to have to excuse us. We're a little groggy at the moment because we were up late last night partying for Cody's birthday. Yay. Um, so we're a little, like, at the moment. We're a little... Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, Cody, how's it been? Not too bad. I had a pretty good birthday. I went to Mile High Comics and bought like a, for a hundred dollars worth of comic books. All Punisher comics because I needed to. Uh, because uh, I pulled like I was dumb when I bought these like co- Punisher comics like a couple weeks back and I bought the like one issue that was totally to a different series and about two of the same series but they weren't in order so it was like one and three and then the book two from a different issue. So I had to finish that out, and then I just saw a bunch of old com- other Punisher comics that I wanted to be wanted to read and stuff. So I just got all of them. Neat. Yep. And then my mom got me a switch. Woot, mom. <laughs> neat. You're neat. Thank you. You're neat. You're pretty neat too. Oh, thanks. Aww. Aww. Um, before we go out, we want to give a quick shout out to our latest Patreon supporter, Art of the Crow. Um, thank you so much for supporting us on Patreon, and this episode's dedicated to you. Thank you. You are the best. You are so beautiful. Even though to we me. haven't seen your face. You know, it's, it's the thought that counts, okay? <laughs> Maybe they really needed that, and now it's, now it's ruined. Um, moving forward, yeah, I got nothing really exciting on my plate. Uh, I'm sorry, didn't you just graduate? Oh, yeah, that is true. Uh, I guess that is kind of a big deal. I, had, I I finally had my graduation ceremony from college. Yay. So, yay. Moving on up. We're just moving, moving on, on up. up. Moving on up. <laughs> moving on up. Ew. Um, I don't know. Do we got anything Ooh. else we need to go over? I don't um, think so. Let's just get to it. Let's get to it. Getting then. to the butt. Getting the, the butt. episode. In the butt. What, what? I, in will, the butt. I will say before we continue that I am happy that Queer Eye has a second season on Netflix. <laughs> I, cool. That Good show you. is great. Okay. okay? What? All right. They have Let's... the bet. Look, here's the thing. They have the greatest ideas for indoor decoration and just like taking care of yourself all right i'm all for look i have two speeds in life one is very gritty dirty torn clothes punk rock i don't care how i look and the other is i like to wear a suit and know that i don't smell like anus all the time okay i mean it's not hard to not do that i'm just i know for me it kind of is though because like dressing like dirty and gritty is like a lot easier for me to do than just like like, I don't know what matches for clothes. All The only thing I ma- it match is, like, dark colors. Like, black goes with black, and black pretty much goes with anything. I think that's all you need, except a brown belt. See, I wouldn't know that. You don't wear black shoes and a brown belt. I wouldn't know that. So if you wear a suit, you need to match your belt to your shoes. See, I just hide my belt. <laughs> because I don't know why people need to see my belt. I don't understand why that's a thing that has to be seen. Uh, when you take your jacket off. Uh, when I take my jacket off, I still don't see why people have to see my belt. What, do you not tuck your shirt in when you wear a suit? Oh, I thought you were talking about normally. No, no I'm talking about suits. Yeah, no, I actually go for, like, the suspender look. Oh. Then whatever. <laughs> then just wear black suspenders and black shoes. <laughs> yeah, Lauren loves that show, and she's like, I'm gonna put you on it, and I'm like, you can. I just, I, <laughs> like... I don't really know how I'm going to respond if I ever get put on that show. Not that I'm actively seeking to get on it, but... I, I feel like you might be. I mean, like, half and half. <laughs> I'd love to see, like... There's a... I, I always forget all their names because they're so goddamn fabulous. <laughs> and I mean that in the highest compliment possible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, like, they have so much to teach me and I just want to learn. At the same time, I'm just so captivated because I'm like... You guys are just bred for magic, I swear. <laughs> like, the way you walk, the way you talk. Like, it's just pure joy. If I had to look up the definition of happiness, it'd be the Fab Five. 
the Fab Five. Oh, that, yeah, that's what they're called. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Uh, it's probably like the most sellout I'm ever going to sound. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good show, okay? I enjoy it, and it helps me get through my, when I'm, you know, suffering from food poisoning. Okay. Which I've suffered from food poisoning this week, so. I, I know. I wasn't. I wasn't shitting on you liking the show. I just. All right. I just, okay. It's a great show. All right. We get it. It's a good show. I think. I don't know. I haven't watched it. Look. Here's the thing. I watch so many things that have macabre and gore and death and blah in them that like I try to throw in a little little ray of sunlight every now and then and like because Lauren doesn't like to watch all the same shows I like and that's like one of the few things we can watch together is Queer Eye. Dev got me into 100% Hotter. I have no idea what that is. They're so mean. That's all you really need to know. <laughs> Are they really? So, like, so the basic the basic premises of the show is that it's it's so... She really likes British television, I guess. Because, like, everything that we watch together is, like, British shows. And so it's this British... These three British models. Like, they're, they're, they work in the model industry. There's right. the guy who's the hairdresser. Um, and then there's the... Uh, girl, there's a girl who does all the makeup, and then there's a girl who does all the clothes, and so pretty much, these people nominate their friends who have horrible, horrible <coughs> fashion. Oh, wait, sense. is this on Netflix? Yeah, it's on Netflix. Oh, I think I've seen this. Oh yeah, they have horrible like fashion sense. In in regards of like them, like the people who are getting nominated to come on the show, are to- most of them are totally fine with how they look. They're like, yeah, I, I don't care, whatever. This is yeah, this saw, is me. Wasn't there on the preview? Isn't there like a chick that like is dressed up in goth? Yeah, there's there's a couple goth chicks that get thrown. What's in wrong that. with that? Well, okay, so I actually that was the first episode I watched, and so the goth chick gets put on there. She has this hardcore goth makeup, but the thing is, is she's a goth model. And her friend Wait, said, what? like, and her, she goes out and she doesn't do it all the time. Like, she doesn't dress goth all the time. She does it most of the time. But so her friend's like, she does all this, like, crazy, hardcore goth makeup out when she goes out and about. Nobody likes looking at her. She's actually really pretty and blah, blah, blah. And so, like, she goes in front of these three model people and they're like, oh, my God, you are horrible. Like, they're so mean to them. Wow. So mean. And I'm like. But what if that's how they, what makes them happy? Like, it's different when, like, there's this mom who, like, she knew she needed to change. And she's like, I just don't know where to go. I need to step in the right direction because I don't want to embarrass my kids anymore. And, like, the the model people were super nice to her about it. They're like, oh, you know, you're not that bad. I mean, your, your fashion is out of date and we'll help you, like, get more up to date on it. But, like, some of the people that get down on there, they're such assholes. And I laugh so much because, like... They pretty much tell this person that, like, you're a piece of shit for dressing the way you are. And they show the picture of them of how they're dressed on the show. Like, they get introduced in the show to a yeah. bunch of people, like, random people in the crowds, and, like, on the streets and stuff. And they rate them on, an, on a scale of 1 to 10. And most of them start off at, like, 3s and 2s. And then they do this whole dress over and they're like, you are now 100% hotter because I picked it all out for you. Jesus. Yeah, I just thought the goth one was funny because the goth girl is just like, I mean, I like it, but I'm going to go back to the way I was. I was making money by being a goth model. <laughs> I don't care if people don't like me on the streets. I'm making scroll. You think I give a fuck about you plebs? Yeah. And, so, like, and then they're like, yeah. And, and then my show like After Effects, like because they're supposed to send them pictures, at, like the show pictures after like a month or two of being on the show. Yeah. Like if they kept up with their fa- uh, fashion or if they went back to their old ways. And the goth girl, and like the announcer on the show is like, yeah, she just, uh, like very disappointingly too, like she just, uh, she decided to go back to the way she was and everything and showed her goth pics. And I was like, they're not even that bad. Like, no. they're not terrible. Like, the, I, I agree when she came on the show, she had this, all this like huge black makeup, like looked like someone tore her mouth open and shit. I was just like, I mean, that's a little much, but the rest of her outfit is like, whatever. I think it's cool. Yeah. I was like, okay, I mean, you don't have to be such an asshole to her. Like, just like, all right, well, let's try something different instead of, oh my God, you're horrid. Let's get you into something else that I like because I apparently work in fashion. See, that's why I like the Fab Five. They're like constructive criticism. Yeah. No, they just like make them feel like shit and then they dress them. They're like, see, this looks better. <laughs> and like, you can see them like 
some of the can, some of the people that are on there they'll see their new outfit and like some of them are like oh my god this is great this is awesome and then there's a couple of them you could just see it in their face like i don't like this like it's nice but i don't like it this outfit makes me want to die <laughs> <laughs> yeah like there's this one gay guy he was uh he's called a tweak and so they turned him into an otter so an otter is just a tall skinny gay guy yeah. so like you know there's bears there's otters and there's twinks of course I, I didn't know about this otter that was a new term to me i was like huh all right and now we know yeah knowing's half the battle G-I-G-I, G- okay. <laughs> I don't know if we can actually say that on here. I don't know. I don't know if we'd get in trouble. The more you know. Anyways, all right, <laughs> let's get into this. So yep. so we, we decided to do an episode talking about what's better in horror, uh, practical effects or CG effects. Um, and we also posed this question on our Twitter and our, fa- uh, excuse me, our Facebook. So I'll go over the Twitter first. I tweeted out, Hey everyone, for our next Monday episode, we are talking about which is better in horror, practical effects or CGI effects. What is your opinion and what do you prefer? And uh, from Punk Rocky and at Punk Rocky, and he said, I think it depends on one, what kind of story is being told, and two, what kind of budget is available. Personally, I like practical effects, but CG is okay if it looks decent. We need more people like Tom Savini. Which I completely agree. I do too. And then from our latest Patreon supporter, Art of the Crow, at uh, Brad Crow, it depends on how much time and money they have to do on SFX or PFX. Because when it's good, it's hard to tell if it's SFX or PFX, but when it's bad, it's easy to tell. As a digital artist, my preference would be SFX since it's a lot less money than PFX, but PFX has been around longer. And then from Anna at Anna Keeson, totally Anna. depends on the scenario and budget. CG is great for creating new worlds in the cinematic universe, but only when used correctly. When it comes to horror movies, I feel the practical effects do a better job creating a scarier, quote unquote, movie, but because it's more real. Mm. So mm. it seems to be on the Twitter general consensus it depends on the type of movie that's being made for it. Yeah. What and about our Facebook, Cody? Our Facebook, uh, James posted, I like practical effects m- more, especially in a low-budget film. Uh, the Mad Pooper, Aaron, <laughs> <laughs> she said, oh, 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 the less CGI, the better. I am a thousand percent in love with practical effects, smiley face. Oh, should we throw in Mackie's? Mackie said, well, <laughs> if it's a real snuff film, you don't have to worry about it then. Winky face. Oh. You got, you got told down the to trolling, Mackie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess that's not the worst trolling we could ever receive. No. I mean, he did make a callback to our uh, one of our more recent episodes where we talked about snuff films. So I it, guess it's kind of cool. I don't know. I think he commented on one of our posts or something being like, Yeah, you better mention me. <laughs> Relax, Mackie. Jesus. <laughs> Your enthusiasm is definitely inspiring, but God. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so... Uh, so the consensus on Facebook is just practical effects. Right. So. And so the way we divided this up, listeners, is that we decided to uh, do it uh, separately. So I took on practical effects and Cody took on CG effects. So we're going to start off with uh, practical effects first, right? Yep. So I'm going to go a little bit over, you know, like we normally do, history and how it's done. Um, so special effects... Um, or practical effects is a special effect produced physically without computer generated imagery or other post production techniques a staple in action movies is the use of practical effects such as gun wounds fires and explosions and prosthetic makeup is part of practical effects and the way prosthetic makeup is done is, or is created is the process of using prosthetic sculpting which is molding and casting techniques to create advanced cosmetic effects. Prosthetic makeup was revolutionized by John Chambers in such films as Planet of the Apes and Dick Smith in Little Big Man. The process of creating a prosthetic appliance begins with life casting, the process of taking a mold of a body part to use as a base for sculpting the prosthetic. The process used uh, to... uh, 
oh my god, I'm losing my place. I'm sorry. The process used to us, uh, al- and I always have a problem pronouncing this word, alignate, al- alignate, alignate, a l g i n a t e for the molds, but recently silicone safe rubber has been used um, instead. And then once a negative mold has been created, it is promptly filled with gypsum cement, most commonly a brand called the UltraCal 30, to make a positive mold. The form of the prosthetic is sculpted in clay on top of the positive. One of the hardest parts of this prosthetic makeup is to keep the edge as thin as possible. And I got all this uh, from Wikipedia. Um, and mm-hmm. so, um, you know, if you've ever watched, have you ever seen, a, what is it, Face Off? Yeah, with uh, <laughs> with John Travolta and Nicolas Cage. No, I mean the show. But... Oh, <laughs> you're talking about the movie. I was like, why? I was like, Wait. why does that have to do with it? I was like, when was John Travolta and Face Off? <laughs> no, I'm talking about the show where like they had it was like a bunch of oh, makeup artists. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so they did that a lot in that show, and there was also another show on Sci-Fi called Monster Man that mm. I was I'm really sad it never came back, and it was uh, this I always forget what the guy's name is, but he was known to do a lot of like awesome effects for like low budget horror films mm-hmm. and like he like they would show, bring you into his shop and show you how he would make like giant sharks and monsters and gore like he even did one for like Wee Man when Wee Man was working on a horror movie huh. <coughs> I don't <know. coughs> oh god that was disgusting yeah seriously <laughs> I don't know if that movie ever came out, but all I know is it had to do with aliens. It was a weird episode. Um, but so yeah, the, the, uh, with this being said, there's obviously a lot of work that goes into practical effects, and it does take like an actual like artist hand to pull it off really, really well. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, just just thinking of, I think probably one the one movie I know that's been you know synonymous and huge to do these practical effects is the evil dead series yeah um not the remake the original um specifically i would probably always go with evil dead 2 just because like uh there is so much more done in the second one than in the first one and they went way over the top with it in the second one although the first one does deserve its own accolades because it's like it, it was just it was meant to be just a cheap like student film yeah and it like made such headway for the horror genre entirely. I mean, what do you think? Oh, uh, with just practical effects and horrors? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think practical effect, like, it definitely it makes them more immersive, in my opinion, when they use practical effects in horror movies. Um, one of my all-time, all-time favorite horror movies is uh, American Werewolf in London. And just that transformation scene, like, the fact that they did it mostly using practical effects when he's turning into the werewolf and it was like uh they had to do it pretty it was basically like stop motion i think is what they did because they had to like take picture a picture or film like each little transformation like slowly throughout the whole entire thing and it was done really really well um and then also like cool thing with practical effects i'm gonna actually use uh this argument in my or this movie in my uh in the cg part two but jurassic park the first one that was straight up a horror movie oh yeah like i would argue i will argue to death that if it's not a horror movie it is a scary movie like that t-rex scene like made people poop with their poop their pants <laughs> like in velociraptor scenes and like the use of practical effects in that one um with the velociraptors like in the kitchen those are just people in suits like, from the far-out shots and stuff like that, okay. which I thought was actually really cool. And also the fact that they actually created the the T-Rex. Like, they built that. Wow. <laughs> and also, Jaws. The first Jaws. Oh, yeah, huh. The shark was all practical. They did not use any CG for the shark. You know, there was an article that came out recently. I, I, maybe it was bloody disgusting. I could be mistaken. But they were making the case that the third Jurassic Park movie was actually more of a horror film than anything. Yeah, it was. So... Um, I didn't read. I would agree with that one. I didn't read the article, but they're making that case. I I think it was bloody disgusting. I could be wrong though. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think using practical effects is actually done uh, when done right. Like can be really really immersive. But then there are times where it's like, eh, yeah. Like it it definitely takes you out, and you're kind of like, oh, that looks bad. The thing is, is that I can't. 
I can't remember all bad movies that had bad practical effects, and then I can't think of good ones like The Thing, which mm-hmm. is also a huge movie that only used practical effects, like, and it still stands to this day. Like, it oh, still yeah. stands stands up and holds See, up. I also think that practical effects they have a longer, uh, it, they they can last longer. Well, I think like, what's... You know, like they can are you know what I mean like stands to this day yeah like the effects like hold up today. they don't they don't fall out as date yeah they fall out of date as much except for Jason three oh yeah dude that the practical effects in that movie were so bad and it's I know it's because they were trying to do like the whole three D with it oh yeah but like when he like squeezes the dude's head at near the end of the film and his yeah. eyes pop out yeah. you can see the springs and like. When he shoots the chick in the face with the crossbow, you can see the string that the crossbow is on and stuff. And so, like, I was watching, I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the thing that makes, like, practical effects more terrifying is that it, it is real. Like, it's mm-hmm. real. And so, that, you know, you can't really see the lines or the, the bad editing on CG. Like, or that you, like, you can on CG and you can't see it on practical effects as much unless it's just poorly done effects. Uh-huh. But I, I think because, you know, it's it's more real, it gives a more unnerving effect to it, which makes it more terrifying. I mean, what do you think? Um, I, I, I agree and I don't. I think practical effects actually work more better when you, like, it was, unless they, if they go all in with it, like, the thing. Where, like, they pretty, the, for the original thing, not the original, but the one that everybody knows. Um, like, they went all in on the practical effects. They wouldn't want to use any CG or anything, and it holds up today because they put their heart and everything in yeah. it. Yeah. But then when you have movies like, like, uh, like I said, the the third Jason movie, that's the only one that I could really think of right now. Yeah. Um, like it does not hold up today. It, I don't even think it held up back then. I think it, they you need everyone to kind of go into it because like if it's not good practical effects whatsoever, it t- yeah, there's no effort into it. It's just like a cash grab, and they're like. Ah, we'll just use like these practical effects for it. I think it could really like make it more of a comedy than a horror movie. Yeah, no, I, it definitely you, you're not as enveloped into it by then. But I do, I do think there's an artistry to practical effects that's widely overlooked. I mean, oh yeah, like I mean, look at everything that Tom Savini's done. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's. I mean, if we're gonna talk about notable figures, you know. Some of the most notable figures in practical effects, you know, are Tom Savini, who did Don the Dead, Creep Show, uh, Rob uh, Bodden, which did Robocop and Total Recall, Jamie Hyman, the dude from Mythbusters, who <laughs> did Arachnophobia and Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, Gianto, uh, Gianto De Rossi, who did Cannibal Holocaust and The House by the uh, Cemetery, and even Rick Baker, who did Hellboy and Gremlins 2, mm-hmm. which Hellboy was a phenomenal movie, and I still stand oh, by yeah. that. Um, I mean, just you know, and the, that's just like a small like handful, and there's a huge amount of like practical effects artists that get overlooked, and they definitely deserve a little more attention, just because of the amount of time and effort they put into just pull off scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it just kind of blows my mind. Even like what is it from Scanners, where like they sh- where they got <laughs> yeah. that effect with the head exploding with just a shotgun. Like yeah. it's like it, it's like things like that that I really appreciate. Like the way they pull off effects that you don't really think of. Like I really wish I could have been the guy with the shotgun because you know he was just sitting in the background watching the scene and stuff like that with a shotgun. Going, All right. <laughs> just waiting for his moment to shoot the little watermelon <laughs> you gotta kind of wonder if it was like all by accident it's like just some just some guy who was just like a bit of an idiot at work and he's just like have you seen my new shotgun isn't this great look at the barrel and he's just like whoop drops it and <laughs> blows off the effect of the head that was perfect we're gonna keep that put it in the movie <laughs> yeah it's like we were gonna use squibs but that was so much better that was, that was great good job you're promoted and that's how Michael Bay got his start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we should probably talk about like the conflict between um, practical and CG here soon. But I want to mm-hmm. give you a chance to talk more about CG. All right. Um, so the definition for CG is con- uh, computer generated Im- imagery. CGI uh, is the application of computer graphics to create or contribute to images in art, print media, video games, films, television, shorts. Uh, pro- commercials, videos, and simulators. Um, so the 
visual scene may be dynamic or static and may be two-dimensional through the term CG, though the term CGI is most commonly used to refer to 3D computer graphics and used for creating scenes and special effects in films and, tel and television. Um, yeah, and that's, I got all that from Wikipedia also. because you know. Citing our sources. Oh, oh, oh. Um, but one thing that I uh, wanted to go over, that one thing that I actually really like about CG, especially in horror movies, because, like, so it's actually kind of hard to argue, like, CG makes horror movies better, mostly, be just, mostly because, like, when you think CGI in horror movies, you really do think of, like, all the really bad horror movies. Most, most notably, the sci-fi movies. Yeah. <laughs> Sharktopus. Um, Sharktopus. The uh, Yeti. Me uh, Mecha Shark. Uh, Mega Python, Mega Boa, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. All those kind of movies. And so you're like, oh, my God, CGI in movies are horrible. But Except one we're not, we're not going to shit on Sharknado because that's a... No. That's a beauty in its own creation. Said, you know what? I actually like Sharknado <laughs> a lot. That so... and also just because like David Michael mm -hmm. follows us on Twitter, and I, I don't want to lose him. Oh no, I, I'm, but I liked it before I even knew he was following us. So I just thought it was yeah. nice. I was like, um, sweet. <laughs> but what's kind of one thing that I thought was kind of cool is until relatively recently, horror movies were the domain of practical effects. So like they didn't even start using CGI uh, until the mid 1990s. And then that's also like when CG like pretty much started. Well, I mean that's no. when like it what started. What about uh, like in Children of the Corn at the end, like the very 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 end when they finally defeat I think it's like Malachi and you see the demon rise up from the like actual corn. Well, I'm saying that it wasn't a whole lot. Oh, like, there's okay. not a whole lot of influence on it until the mid 1990s. God, I'm that maybe guy. she just listened to when I sorry, talk. podcast over. Podcast <laughs> over. <laughs> Um, but I think like when you're using, when you're using CG, it's just like practical effects. If you're not, heart's not in it. Like it's not going to be good. Like this, I, I know it's a video game movie, but like another notable reference where they had a huge buzz it, budget and they just shit on all the CG, especially with the monsters is uh, alone in the dark. Oh yeah. So bad. Yeah. It's that so one, bad. That one's a bit rough. Mm hmm. But, um, one one movie that's actually pretty recently that they use CG really really well, and I thought and like it definitely de uh, put me more in it was the new It, the remake. Yes, I thought like you can tell like you can and you could kind of tell that it's CG because there's no way that like um, when he's contorted in the fridge. Yeah. Like uh, one thing that I know like yes he did contort himself in the fridge but when he's like walking out and like every all his bones are popping back into place that's all computer graphic yeah so like one thing i know uh i re realized in horror movies that i read up on this is actually from sci-fi.com talking about cg movies is that most horror movies they use cg to help with the practical effects yeah like to enhance it mm -hmm. so like uh for instance jurassic park a lot of the con scenes with uh the t-rex it's a it's the actual t-rex like that they built the practical t-rex that they built and stuff like that but they enhance his movements and like motions and stuff with cg so it looks and smooth yeah. smooths out which if you didn't know that was computer graphic you could swear to god that was a real t-rex yeah <laughs> like, i mean you can kind of tell the bracket sources are cg now mm -hmm. i mean obviously yeah but like i think in movies such as like mama the her that she was he actually because it was a guy that was playing mama yeah because he's an actual <laughs> contortionist yeah because he's an actual contortionist and stuff like that like yeah they cg'd him all over and stuff like that but it still yeah. paid off really well like yeah you could kind of tell it's cg but it still was super immersive i think like probably the one horror movie i always think of that had really great cg that still doesn't get a lot of attention is like planet terror yeah, Planet Fucking Terror. From uh, Robert Rodriguez and uh, mm -hmm. I think Quentin Qu Tarantino. Yeah, Quentin, yeah, Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino worked on it too. Like, which Tom Savini is in as well. Yeah, <laughs> Tom Savini is in a lot of Quentin Tarantino movies. Oh yeah, he is. Dust Till Dawn. Mm -hmm. Fucking, oh, I, we could go down a whole list there, but probably think, shouldn't. Is he in Pulp Fiction? No. No? No, I don't. he's not in Pulp Fiction. Oh, okay. If he is, then it's a small part and I didn't notice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, another really good CG movie. Actually, early CG movie that they used. Uh, that still holds up today, in my opinion. Event Horizon. Oh. Uh, that was a very CG heavy movie. We're we gonna talk about Super Troopers. Or not Space C Force. 
<laughs> no, no Starship Troopers. I meant Starship, Starship troopers. troopers. Yeah, but I like. Um, I thought the C, like I think they personally made the CG a little bad in that movie because they were leaning towards more like B movie. Yeah. Look. Yeah, that movie terrified me as a kid. I know that scene where like the it's... bugs are just tearing the people apart and stuff like that. Yeah. Was just, when I was a kid, I was like. Why would you let me watch this? Or the scene like where he takes the it's like that big huge like maggot slug thing takes out its needle oh, and yeah, just like it sticks into the dude's head and just <laughs> like a crazy straw. <laughs> and I like my sister told like was trying to keep me from watching it and I would keep trying to sneak around. And I saw that scene and I was like, oh no, <laughs> why? You were right. I should have stayed in my room. <laughs> oh my god. Also, fun fact about Jurassic Park. Did you know the lost raptors are supposed to be the size of turkeys? Yeah. They're actually using the Utah raptors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought that was cool. Yeah. Anyways. Actually, um, I just got done telling Dev and my mom that. Because uh, we went to the... Uh, on my actual birthday on Wednesday, we went down and we went to the uh, the dinosaur... Little dinosaur... Dinosaur Ridge. Oh, okay. And so we went through the small museum and then there was a picture... Like, there's a model... Like a big model of the Utah Raptor in life size, like what they believe the actual size of it is. Yeah, it's and like it's, twenty feet long. Yeah, and it's the T, and it's the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park. And like Dev was like, "Hey, look, I know that one." I was like, "Actually, fun <laughs> fact, I'm going to be this guy today." Here's what you don't know: uh, the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park are actually modeled after after Utah Raptors, and because the Utah Raptor wasn't as feathery and looked more like this. And the reason why they called it Velociraptor is because that sounded more menacing than a Mormon raptor. Can you just imagine <laughs> at the fucking end where the T-Rex is like, just like eats a turkey one and then another turkey was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just like fucking jumping on the T-Rex. He's like, ah, this is less hurtful and more annoying. <laughs> yeah. The entire time you're hearing, get off me! Oh, my small arms are gonna be the death of me! <laughs> Big head and little oh, arms. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, and I think another like good movie that uses uh, that uses CGI really well. Actually, especially like in the older movies, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. They're really CG heavy, but they did a good blend of like CG and practical effects. Like oh, yeah, they would with use the, the whole blood coming out of the bed. Yeah, the blood coming out of the bed. I thought that was a great, great use of practical effects. And like fun fact about how they did that is that they actually modeled the entire room upside down. So when they, instead of like a geyser, they're actually that's actually <laughs> um, on the ceiling, and they just had a bunch of people like standing on top and just dumping buckets of blood through this geyser so it was like actually falling onto the floor which was the ceiling um so they could create that entire effect um which has a good reference for like uh practical effects but i think one good uh nightmare on elm street movie that they used was a mix of like cg and practical was actually uh the dream warriors which i will argue that i think that one's still the best dream you know someone made a life-size uh, sculpture of the snake freddy from dream warriors oh yeah yeah <laughs> nice but like i think that has good like use of like special effects and visual and uh cgi like when he sticks his head out of the um out of the tv when that one chick wants to be like a, a movie star or whatever and like before he it's goes prime, prime time, time bitch. bitch like that's like a good mixture of cg and practical effects so like, yeah one thing that i uh that when people say is like i hate cg in horror movies one thing you gotta know is that a lot of the movies that like pride themselves on practical effects actually use CG to enhance it. Yeah. So. So. Um, I think there's. I think there is a need for both of them because like if because if you were to watch Jurassic Park and they did a hundred like yes they had the budget because of Steven Spielberg but if they didn't have that budget and they were still going with all practical effects like you'd think they would probably turn out like that those fucking like cowboys versus dinosaurs like wait those old movies with the claymation dinosaurs and stuff i see what you're saying yeah and and, go ahead no go ahead oh, i was just gonna make fun of it just... oh okay <laughs> i was like and also like when you also think about it the newest godzilla movie because i know like all the original godzilla movies is just a dude in a suit yeah and the only cg they use is where he's breathing fire creature suit if they used a creature suit for the newest godzilla movie it would have been nowhere near as good as it, it would have been pretty funny it would have been horrible like i think the fact that godzilla was cg'd in that movie was fantastic yeah godzilla is meant to be a cg monster for sure yeah so i think that w- there's like 
there is a need and a call for CG when it's like certain movies and stuff like that. Like a lot of space movies, yes, Aliens did a really good job with using practical effects for the most part and everything. Yeah. But like, I also think there is the need for CG in those kind of type of movies, like Event Horizon. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, and even Starship Troopers. Like, if that was all practical effects, that would have been so bad, <laughs> so bad. <laughs> I mean. It's Starship Troopers, so I, I, it was one way or the other, really, with that one. I know. <laughs> uh, well, t- if we're talking, if we're going to talk about the conflict though between practical and CG, um, again, I got this from Wikipedia, but uh, Tom Woodruff Jr. and Alec Gillis, two experienced SFX artists from uh, Amalgamated Dynamics near LA, share show, uh, blah, share what they see as the middle ground on the subject. In your interview, they explain that most movies use out of necessity a combination of practical effects and cgi they see cgi as a tool that can be utilized in a good way or a bad way just like practical effects and tom savini the most well-known sfx artist in the world basically um states they still use the makeup uh guys to design creatures and that's what they work from i don't think you'll see makeup effects design the creature and Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Da, 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 da. I don't think you'll see makeup effects guys hanging out in the corners with signs that say "We'll do effects for food," yeah. um, which so obviously th- they're making a point here that CG relies far more on practical effects to get the job done. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it's which I I don't fully disagree with at all. I mean, I think that that is a very good point. I mean, because it's, it's... I can only imagine how hard it is just to create something out of thin air just from CG. And I feel like it's a lot easier just to use CG to enhance something that's already made. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's... I'm trying to think of, like, a good movie that this works with. I'll top my head. Um, where... Wait, for what? Was CG enhancing? Yeah, and where it didn't do good when it was just CG by itself. Um... I think that goes back to like the really bad, bad yeah. sci-fi films. Yeah, there's or, the bad sci-fi films. Oh, also the 2000 Godzilla. Oh yeah, huh? <laughs> the Matthew Broderick one. Yeah, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yeah, or they had, versus <laughs> Lizard Man. He had a really bad day off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, no. like I, that's that's another one I think of like a huge high budget film, and the CG was just. Bad. Was, I mean, given it was tainted because like they're trying to call him Godzilla, and that was not Godzilla. No, no, and they actually like came out with a film where like Godzilla killed that Godzilla. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That it was lizard. Godzilla two thousand or War of the Monsters, something, something like, that. like that. Or Godzilla just like went and fucked up all of his enemies. Yeah, and that one he's just like, yeah, he like because that one like pops up and starts chasing him, and then Godzilla literally just kicks it in the face into a building and then just shoots it over and over and over again. <laughs> Never to be resurrected again. <laughs> but, yeah, I think that's a, that's another version uh, example of like really, really bad CG, and then you compare it to the newest Godzilla where it's like really great CG. Well, and I think the thing is, is that movie companies go with CG over practical um, because I feel like it can be done a lot quicker. I think it can be done quicker and you could, when you think about it you can try, you can get a lot of like especially when you're dealing with giant monster movies. Yeah. Like for instance, Pacific Rim. That is a heavy, oh, heavy yeah. CG movie and it's beautiful. Yeah. Like beautiful. I think that movie will still hold up like years down the road. Yeah, the, I mean, the first one still holds up right now. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not super old, but still. But I think that's why a lot of, you know, uh, production companies go with, like, CG just because it's easier. It's, I, I don't know if it, I feel like it might be more expensive. I would think so. Um, But it, it's easier to go with that and they get they can get more out of it for the type of movie they're going for. Mm-hmm. Where it's like practical effects, they kind of have to wait for it to be built and to make sure it actually works. And if it doesn't work, then they have to go back to the drawing board and redo the scene. Where it's like with CG, you can do it after the scene is already shot. Mm-hmm. Like uh, one one good example is Jaws with practical effects going wrong. In a sense, they had to build like five Bruces, yeah. which is the name of the shark from Jaws. And they had to build five of them because the first one sank. 
<laughs> the next one couldn't work right in the water and everything. But Steven Spielberg was like, we're not using a CGI shark. <laughs> like, I want this actual shark. But that's also why the shark isn't in as many scenes as, like, you originally wanted him to be. Yeah. So, like, I think that's also why there's the big headache of using practical effects when, like, yes, even though the Jaws movies, like, it ended up working perfect, like, you know, after all those shots and stuff, but they always had to do a lot of reshoots, and there was always the, uh, they had to do a lot of reshoots, they had to do a lot of retakes because the shark wasn't working right. And then they always saw how to build five different sharks, so that put more time and stuff like that. Well, and I think it also like has to do with the safety with the actors because mm-hmm. it's, you know, you can just put an actor in a harness, put them on a green screen, and you pretty, do the scene, and you're done. And then, like I said, just edit it afterwards. Yeah, like when but, Ron Perlman got eaten by the baby guy uh, the, in the Pacific Rim when he got eaten by the baby um, one. What what did he get eaten by? A baby guy, uh, kaiju. kaiju. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I remember now. <laughs> yeah, I remember now. Yeah, that was the most surprising scene out of the whole thing, because everyone was just like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, because I feel like you do risk more of an injury factor with practical effects if it breaks down on an actor. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I don't know if this goes into practical effects, but there's actually a famous actor, and I'm forgetting his name, who died on set when a helicopter actually did crash into him. Oh, for the... the uh, do you know what I'm talking about? The Twilight Zone movie. Yeah, I, I don't remember what it was. I don't remember what it was called, and I don't remember the actor's name, uh, unfortunately, which I apologize for. Um, but, yeah, like, he had a helicopter fall on him, and he died in that actual scene. Or even mm-hmm. um, with uh, Ben-Hur, mm-hmm. with, you know, <laughs> the controversial horse deaths in that movie... Yep. Um, all Jackie Chan's movies, all the times he broke his bones and stuff yeah. like that. Well, those are real stunts, though. No, I know. I'm just saying, like... Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. It goes with it. Because, like, uh, Police Story, instead, of, I don't think CG was as, like, was a thing back then, but, like, when he does, when he slides down the pole through all the lights and stuff like that... Yeah. They, like, instead of sliding down a pole and then adding the CG effects of the lights, like, blowing up and stuff like that later, so, where he, so he wouldn't get burned and stuff like that, like, he just went and did it. Yeah. So, like... Yeah. I think that's another example of, like, practical effects being harmful. So, I mean... Well, and also, uh, again, with Jurassic Park, the Velociraptors, they were just people in suits. And, fun fact, when the Velociraptors are walking into the um, kitchen... Yeah. You can see someone, like, have to push the Velociraptor up so it's standing upright. (laughs) Like, it's actually in the final cut of the movie. You can, like, I see it every time now when I watch the movie... You just see this hand go, boop. Like, so the Velociraptor, the dude in the suit, doesn't fall over. <laughs> oh, now I gotta see this. <laughs> now I gotta watch it, watch it again. <laughs> I'm falling, I'm falling, I got you! <laughs> yeah, basically, because, like, he takes one step, and, like, the tail's, like, about to fall over, which made the whole suit fall over, and you just see this guy go, and <laughs> just lean forward and push the butt of the Velociraptor. So I got he doesn't... you! <laughs> yeah, it's just like, don't worry. <laughs> I shall protect you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think we've we spent a lot of time on this. I, mm-hmm. I don't know. Are we, do you feel like we're getting to the end? Yeah, I think my biggest thing about it is like I feel like if you do, uh, unless you have the budget, unless a movie has the budget and the actual like heart and soul into it, like the thing, I feel like uh, for an all practical effect movie and then something like Pacific Rim, that was, I would say, 90% um, CG and looks great like unless you don't for both arguments for both is that like you have to have the heart and soul into it or else it's going to turn out like a straight to sci-fi movie where it's just garbage yeah looking. I, feel, I feel like we we spent like a short time on the subject i think it might be i think we probably spent longer we just probably got caught up with it <laughs> yeah, so time flies by we damn fun um for I me i uh i i think practical effects are at home with horror movies, mm-hmm. I, I I think that's where you see them really shine because you definitely see the most best effects with blood, with gore, with severed limbs, exploding limbs, everything. In horror movies, you see it mostly shine through practical effects, in my opinion, and not as much uh, CG effects. Because I can't think of as 
many movies that have a ton of CG in them, besides like Planet Terror, that I really, really like. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely tend to lean more towards the movies that use practical effects in horror as as my favorite, as my preferred movie. And so I, I, I enjoy practical effects, um, although I'm not against CG enhancing it. Yeah, I think especially in horror movies, the use of CG is more of an enhancement. And I, I do like that. And, uh, cause like, I mean, my favorite horror movies, most of them, you, except for Grave Encounters, I feel like is a good movie where there's a blend of both. Yeah. Because it actually is like, uh, when I was watching the, the like, uh, not the documentary, but the like, uh, the short little like clips on the DVDs where they talk about scenes and stuff like that, there's actually a lot more CG in that movie than I actually thought. Like almost all the scenes with the ghosts are all CG'd. Yeah. And so, like, with the ghosts coming out, uh, their hands coming out of the ceilings and stuff like that, like, I couldn't tell it was CG. Right. And it, I wasn't even, like, a, the biggest budgeted film. And I, so, like, I think when it comes to specific ty- types of horror movies, CG will make it a lot better. So, like, I think ghost, ghost horror movies, monster, uh, monster movies, if the CG's done right, it'll look good. I agree. So. I agree. Um, with that being said... <laughs> We actually have a story this time. Yay! Yay! Um, and this one is actually from your girlfriend. Ew! So she's decided to <laughs> share a story with us. Um, so Dev wrote in. Uh, Wait, can I read it since it's my girlfriend? Okay, okay. Sorry. God. My bad. You read all of Lauren's. Except for like one. When we have to, when we read two. <sighs> God. <laughs> Um, so this one's from Dev, uh, my now former friend and her baby were spending the night and it was pretty late. Her son was having a really difficult time sleeping. So she was laying with him and I was sitting on my couch and where I was sitting, I could see straight into the hallway. The hallway light was off, but the light going up the stairs was on. I heard creaks and footsteps. I just thought it was my brother. Well, I started to see a shadow that was swaying side to side and I still thought it was my brother, but it still didn't move, but it didn't move from that spot i started to feel very uncomfortable i got up and my friend asked what i was going where i was going and i didn't tell her what i was seeing i walked towards it and its swaying stopped i got closer to the base of the stairs and the shadow disappeared up the stairs i heard creaks going up the stairs i was hoping to see my brother but it wasn't him i went and checked on my family to see if any of them were awake and no one was i believe there is something in my house and i don't think it's harm i don't but i don't think it's harmful Maybe just a lost soul. My apartment complex has been around since the 1970s. Well, duh, it's a 1970s ghost. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's they're a ghost. the worst type of ghosts. It's a ghost of the actual Red Foreman, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is nice to have a, a strange story to talk about. I know. Um, well, yeah, if you want, uh, thank you, Dev, for sending that in to us. That is an actual great story, and we appreciate it. Yeah. That sounded really pandering. Just a little bit. <laughs> Let me try that again. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously. Thank you, Dad, for sending in your story. Um, we do like reading our listeners' stories of strange things that happen to them. And if you have a strange story that you want us to read that happened to you, please send it to our email, punkrockhorrorpodcast at gmail.com. Yep. And um, I don't know. We like we still got 10 minutes. I don't really want to close the show yet. Like, like I know we're groggy and just like, <laughs> yeah. we're struggling along because we're just like I'm suff- I'm still dealing with some congestion on my end. You're still well, recovering from all the alcohol. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, well, I guess like some like, we mostly talked about movies, but some of the TV shows that use practical and uh, special effects because I know like when you see CGI effects in TV shows, like they're not the best. And then, right. like, a great example of, like, practical effects in horror TV is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That's a good point. Yeah. Like, yes, the, a lot of the monsters are kind of, like, corny and stuff like that. But, like, Buffy, like, a lot, it was really cool, like, seeing demons and vampires come to life. Same with the X-Files. Like, I still poo myself whenever I see that fucking uh, Bat Boy. I hate that episode. You know, I've I hate never that. watched the X-Files. Really? Yeah, I've never watched it. What is wrong with you? I don't know. It's, it's on Netflix. I get that. Just never watched it. I don't I feel know why. Like you'd like it. I'll have to give it a shot. Like, 
Yeah, it's a lot of like government conspiracy and stuff like that. But like the actual effects of the aliens and the monsters they use, like they're really good. Oh, uh, you know, it's one thing we should actually probably talk about mm. that I just uh, am not thinking about. We should probably talk about that we lost a legend recently. That's um, right. Rest in peace to uh, Vinny Paul and, and condolences to his family and friends. He, yeah, uh, he's now up there drinking whiskey with his brother. Yep. Um, that's really sad. He passed away at 54. From uh, what I saw, he passed away in his sleep. Uh, they didn't. There's no. Re- they haven't released any details. Was like with how or what. If it was just natural causes or mm-hmm. or what it was exactly. Um, they just say he passed away in his sleep. And families that you know asking that everyone respects their privacy, understandably. Yeah, um, that's crazy. That I did, you know, I thought he was older than 54. I mean, it's <laughs> just kind of like weird to think about it because it's like him and like there is such push to have him and like fucking uh phil yeah and all of them just read uh to have a pantera reunion and mm-hmm. it's like phil like and him butt heads a lot and that's basically the reason why they never did yeah and it's just like now we're never going to get that reunion i mean it was it was a far shot that we were ever going to get in the first place but it's like now this kind of like really cements it you know yeah like, I'm glad I got to see him when he, uh, him and Hell Yeah did their very first tour. Yeah. Um, at a it wasn't off, at a, the Family Values tour, and like it was just really cool seeing him because like I was I listened to Pantera all the time when I was little and like actually getting to see one of my like dry, drumming icons. Yeah. Since I play the drums, like seeing Vinnie Paul up on stage was insane. Yeah, he was a legend to like, he, well, not even just legend. He was an inspiration to like a lot of people and like. He, like, you know, I, I even, like, in an interview, he was just like, you know, I'm just focused on music. I have no kids. I, you know, I have no wife. And this is just, like, I, I, I don't know how old, the, how old this interview is, but he's just like, I just focus on the music, and I just and I keep moving on to the next thing. And, like, that's just, like, the definition of real determination in that industry. Yeah. Just the fact that he kept moving and moving. I mean, understandably, in the era he was in, like, that – that atmosphere and that environment he was in there wasn't really anything like pantera so Mm -hmm. it was a lot easier to kind of like make that headway in that sense yeah as as for today where like there's like a little push there's a lot of pushback on current bands saying that they're not doing a good job of like keeping metal alive which i'm not going to get into that argument no i think they are but (laughs) that's just an argument that some like old metal artists are making I mean, and just, like, Vinny, he was just always a really chill dude. Yeah. Like, I would read his, like, uh, his advice columns in the Revolver. And, like, the one that I always remembered, like, was he... There was a dude that wrote in, like, asking about, like, hey, like, I have trouble keeping within rhythm when I'm drumming. What should I do? And, like, Vinny's just like, fucking smoke weed. <laughs> he's just like, he's like, that's what I do. He's like, that's how I keep it, keep it together. He's like, where are my gloves? And I smoke weed, and that's how I just keep with it. I mean, that's, it's not word for word, but that's basically what he said. And I'm just like, yeah, I can respect that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, that's metal. All right. <laughs> All right, man. Yeah. Um, shit, yeah. But that's just really sad that, like, like he passed away. And then, like, Anthony Bourdain and just... Yeah. Uh, oh, man. Just legends. They, legends have been dying this year. They died too young. Like, the past couple of years, man, just, like, all the music artists, like, legends that have been dying, like, Prince, um, Vinnie Paul now, um, yeah. Remy, uh, or Lemmy, Lemmy, Lemmy. Lemmy. I, was I like, Remy. I said Remy, Lemmy, like, a lot of big name artists, especially, like, I know it's, like, people saying, like, well, they're getting up there and stuff, but, like, Vinnie Paul's only 54. Yeah. Like, that's not really getting up there. <laughs> I mean, he's a pretty big guy. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not gonna, like, I'm not trying to shit on his weight or anything like that, but it is a serious thing that he, you know, faced. And I don't, I don't even know if that had anything to do with it, and I'm not gonna try to make that a thing, but no. it's just, like, it's just sad. Mm-hmm. Like, he's just 54, and he's just, like, he's just a legend, dude. Like, yeah. I don't know. Ah, it's just, like, you can't even really imagine, like, hell yeah, moving on without him, but. No, nah, especially because, like, Hell Yeah was kind of his project. Yeah, definitely. For the most part. Because, like, I know... I know. I mean, it was, I mean, it was basically just Mudvayne with Vinnie Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but still, like, I'm fairly certain that was his project. I think he's the one who contacted them to get together. I don't know. Like, I'm not 100% certain. But I know Vinnie Paul was the biggest reason why Hell Yeah succeeded so well. Because everyone was 
so excited to see him back in the limelight and stuff yeah, like that. Drumming came, again. Yeah, when they came back around, like, you know, they're like, yeah, it's great to see him, like, finally back around after Dimebag, like, Dimebag's de- uh, death and everything. Yeah. So. And, yeah. like, everybody was, like, I remember when they got together, everybody was just like, I don't even know if he's going to really do that good of a job. He might be rusty. And he's just like, ha ha, fuck you. Yeah, and he's like, smoke weed every day. And he's like, da 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 That's my noise of that he smoked weed. Yeah. That's how I made that a thing. Yeah, but it's just, oh, man. I just, I just can't wrap my head around it. I just can't, just can't do it. It's gonna be okay. I'm just gonna cry. You'll be fine. Um, you can, you'll you will move on. You'll be okay. Yeah. It's like <laughs> just as rough when like order has passed away. I know. Found that out in the middle of like a shift, and I was just like, "What's the fucking point of moving on? I'm like, going home today. I'm done. Right? I'm just done. Let's fuck it. I'm out of here. <laughs> oh, I know it's one thing we could talk. Uh, no, I don't want to, because it might be this thing that we love. Yeah, I'm sure we got other things we love. Uh, Dead Kennedys. Yeah. I fucking call him to Colorado. So excited about that. That's going to be a great show. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. We got to go see them. Yes. I want us to go see that so bad. I think that would be such a fun fucking show. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess to ra- uh, wrap up this episode, we just want to say that we are starting a new segment where we're interviewing punk bands now. Yeah. So you, you if- got, we've mentioned it a couple times. And mm-hmm. honestly, the thing is about this segment that's going to decided whether it stays or goes is you guys so Mm -hmm. if if you guys like it we're gonna keep it going right now we're just gonna do these interviews once a month yeah um and so we're gonna release them on a wednesday probably the first wednesday of every month and Um, then if we uh if we start getting more punk bands that want to be on the show and stuff like that or metal bands or or metal bands bands, yes um and we'll interview you and we'll let you know when your episode's going to be out and it's not going to be like we're only going to interview you guys once a month like it's not like one of those it's like if no we're just going to release those rele- episodes yeah. once a month for now and then uh once we start getting more headway with that and start getting more bands so we'll start uh releasing them as our wednesday episodes for our release weeks so uh yeah we'll uh we'll give it a test we'll see if you guys like it and if it seems like you guys enjoy it then we'll keep it going and if not then well, we gave it a try, yep. and uh, yeah. So uh, to keep keep in mind, we're not gonna ditch our horror talks and our horror movie reviews. We're still gonna no. do that. This is gonna be an episode by itself. Yeah. So it's not gonna be tacked onto our Monday episodes or our Friday episodes. This is gonna be an episode by itself, and so we're gonna try and include music from these bands so you guys can check them out and their links as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah if you know any punk bands or metal bands that would like to come on the show and do an interview uh, give them our info and send them our way yeah and if you are a band uh, the way you can reach us is through our email at punkrockhorrorpodcast at gmail.com and just send us your info and a link to your music and we'll go from there yep. um, with that being said if you want to keep up with everything that we normally do and you know want to be involved in our Monday participation quarter um do please reach say out to quarter. us. Quarter? Did I say quarter? Yeah. Corner. Sorry. <laughs> corner. On our Monday listener participation corner, uh, please like us, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at official PHP and Punk Rock Horror Podcast on Facebook, um, um, Instagram, uh, Punk Rock Horror Podcast, and hashtag PHP Podcast. If you have any strange stories and want to send your band info to us, please send it into our email at Punk Rock Horror Podcast at gmail um, if you want to support us and you like what we're doing and you know you want to help us out, please go over to our Patreon uh, over there, Punk Rock Horror Podcast on Patreon, um, and think of, you know consider becoming a supporter. We really appreciate it. And also, please continue to send us those your your guys' kind reviews and comments on YouTube and everything. And we really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I, I I got nothing else. Well, I'm, I got none. All right. Uh, well, you can listen to us wherever you can listen to podcasts. Um, you can check us out on our website. Again, it's not updated. We'll let you guys know when it fully is, and the new website is up. Um, but with that being said, uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.